welcome to tonight's conversation. I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, as Yvette said, I'm the editor of Quantum Magazine. And i um, so happy that Stephen Strogatz uh, is joining us tonight to talk all about, really about his career. I mean, my goal here tonight is to try to take you on a bit of a journey behind the scenes of Steve's evolution as a mathematician and teacher through book writing and public speaking and now uh, with the podcast that he is hosting for Quanta. I want to start the conversation by talking about you as a teacher, because I see you beyond all of your wonderful research and all the books and uh, even all the books and all the public uh, speaking that you've done, I see a lot of that at its core as a form of teaching. First of all, why is teaching so important to you? And what is it that you feel like, um, and I, I'll say that my, my own sense of what makes you such a great teacher is a certain level of empathy. Mm -hmm. Okay, because I think that's one thing that separates great teachers and, and teachers who maybe, you know, are trying to communicate something but maybe less successfully. But I want to hear from you. Um, why do you care so much about teaching and what is it that you try to do that's maybe a little bit different? Than mm -hmm. Wow, Tom, you're bowling me over with that introduction and all those super kind words. Thank you. Yeah, you've really put your finger on things that I do care about. The word empathy I would like to single out because um, you very astutely, I think, he really hit the nail on the head. That's, I think that's the single most important thing in teaching and writing um, and communicating, to try to anticipate what's in the listener's mind or in the reader's mind or the student's mind if it's a class. So um, I don't know. It's a really interesting question. Why do I care so much about teaching? That... I don't think anyone ever asked me that before, and I'm not sure I know what I would say. M my instinctive response is because I have something delightful and beautiful that I want to show you. How are you able to strip away what you know? Because I think one of the challenges for people who, um, especially mathematicians, who know a lot about their subject, who are very precise. I mean, it's part of the training, I think, as a mathematician is that you're extremely precise. You want to be very rigorous in the way that you do your mathematics. So everything that you say, you know, there's 10 other statements that you have to say to sort of, you know, <laughs> yes. make that as, as precise as possible. How are you able to both self-edit and put yourself in the shoes of someone who doesn't know the things that you know, right? There's, certain, there's a certain curse of knowledge mm -hmm. hurdle here that you have to be able to say, okay, this person, you know, doesn't necessarily know all the things I know. How do you put yourself in their shoes? This feeling of bursting and wanting to share something can also lead someone to be extremely boring. Right, it's almost the definition of a bore, someone who is going on and on, um, but you don't care what they're talking about. And so that's a key part of good teaching or good writing um, is what you first said, empathy. That I have to, but, but, but the specific part of empathy I'm talking about here is I have to help you love the question. That's the classic mistake. If, if a teacher or the writer goes on about, look at the great way that this problem was solved, or um, so you might spend too much time on the process or even on the answer itself. Look at this amazing theory or result or theorem. Let me show it to you. That is not going to work. The, re the first thing the student has to have is love, which is a bit of a strange thing to say, right? That you don't normally think that math class is about love or, or any other class. But in fact, that's the teacher's first job, is help the student fall in love with the question or the topic or whatever it is. Because once they love it, the, most of your work is done. There's this perception that math is this big, scary, difficult thing and that there's a lot of fear about it in society. And I think that um, you know, a lot of places I've worked um, as a journalist, um, editors would sort of assume that readers would be afraid of math. And so they would you know, try to uh, write stories in a particular way um, but what you said about love, I think, gets at the heart of how to sort of over overcome that fear, right? If you can um, make people care and be interested in it, not necessarily giving them something big and scary and difficult at first, mm -hmm. uh, maybe you, you, you have a better chance. Um, what are some of the tactics to help someone fall in love with a question? Mm -hmm. Humor is one. Sure. If you can get the person laughing, if there's something delightful because it's funny or surprising or tantalizing, that's why puzzles work so well, right? If, if you give a little kid a puzzle that is at the right level for them, 
you don't really have to teach them or tell them anything. They're, I mean, think about this. I, I know I've given plenty of lectures where in the course of the lecture, I'll ask people to start thinking about a problem. If the problem is good, they will stop listening to the lecture. They want to start thinking about the problem. And um, that's because problems of the right type are inherently engaging. And so surprise, humor, those are, those are good tactics. Um, people are interested in people. Mm. If you have a story about mm -hmm. a person, that can work. I mean, there are many devices, and all of your great science writers at, at Quanta know th these things. They're all parts of the hook. So that's why a good writer starts with a hook. Right? And so I think as a teacher, um, it's the same thing. Uh, also, I like that you phrase uh, what I do as being a teacher, because I think of myself if in one word as a teacher. A lot of my colleagues are driven by a desire to solve mysteries. Mm -hmm. And that's a little bit of a different desire. I mean, yes, you can teach yourself something by solving, but um, I'm very happy to explain someone else's solution. <laughs> in other words, I, I think, maybe let me, let me say it this way, I think in math and in science generally, we have in the language of economics a distribution problem, mm. not a production problem. I think we're producing a lot of great math and science that is not landing in its on the target mm -hmm. because we spend so much effort on the creation and the discovery mm -hmm. and we're not so necessarily trained or some of us interested in dissemination. I think of my own grad students who say, I've solved the problem, I can't stand writing it up, I just wanna do the next problem. And I understand that for people who love to solve puzzles, that is the really fun part. Right. But the writing and the explaining is part of the social enterprise of science and, and I think the work isn't done until you do that part. So uh, I love that you uh, went through some of the things that go into empathizing and being able to communicate um, in a way that um, helps people enjoy math and, and, and learning. And uh, I, I want to give this a spin. I want to uh, do this. I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but I, I want to give you a, 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 a uh, something to try out uh, uh -oh. on the crowd. And so uh, I, I'd like to ask you, Oh, did I just notice? Um, I'd like to ask you to um, break down one of the most famous equations and uh, what is widely considered the most beautiful equation in mathematics, uh -huh. Euler's identity. Uh -huh. You know, for, uh, let's imagine an audience of, of people who maybe remember some of high school math, right? Mm. And so this is, um, of course, uh, E i pi plus one equals zero. Mm -hmm. If you could just use some of those skills and techniques to... May I be, while I'm stalling to think of how to do it, <laughs> may, I, may I ask some questions? Of course, of course. <laughs> For instance, does my r listener know E? Should I spend time explaining E? Or do they know I e? think that I think that um, it would be fair to, to assume that, that a lot of people wouldn't know a lot about E. Okay, yes. So there is a certain equation that is often considered the most beautiful equation in all of math uh, that, as Thomas said, is the letter E, which I, I'll tell you what each letter means, E to the I pi power plus one equals zero. So let's first talk about each of the letters. So E, E for exponential, having to do with things that grow exponentially or decay exponentially. So we're seeing that, unfortunately, right now with the pandemic. We've gotten a a very brutal dose of what exponential growth means. When something builds on itself and multiplies by a constant factor week after week or day after day. So exponential growth, um, we see all over the place in the universe, in our own bodies, in the case of viruses proliferating, unfortunately, we also have exponential decay when things decay by a constant factor day after day. So there's, so E is kind of more broadly a mascot of calculus. E is about this kind of continuous change where the thing that's changing keeps changing at a changing rate. So it grows, but grows faster. And the higher it gets, the faster it grows. Or, okay. So E is, to me, a kind of personification of a whole branch of math having to do with growth and decay. Next, I. So E to the I, I for imaginary. The imaginary number that enlarged our concept of what numbers could be. 
This, this was, we think of numbers as little children, as magnitudes, things that you can mark off on a number line or that have to do with counting cookies or whatever. But numbers in more advanced parts of algebra are things that are kind of number-like. They obey some of the rules that we learned about ordinary numbers, but they're more powerful than that. And they were so mysterious when they were first discovered, they were called imaginary because they didn't act like the usual quantities that we thought about. But, but I turns out to be crucial in algebra, and so speaking with this language of personification, I is, part, is sort of our mascot of algebra. Pi, everyone knows, because it's the most famous Greek letter that's a number. Um, that stands in for geometry, but not just geometry of circles. Remember, pi is the ratio of the circumference of a circle to the diameter. But So pi is something about converting straight things like diameters into round things like circles. And there's a very profound mystery about converting the straight to the round, which is that infinity somehow comes into it. You, you all know that if you write down the digits of pi, you get 3.14159. This just goes on forever. They never repeat. They don't show any pattern. So somehow, in making this conversion from the straight to the round, infinity comes into play. And infinity is left out of the equation, but it's sort of lurking there in pi. And um, everybody's interested in infinity. So now we've got calculus, growth, and decay. We've got algebra. We've got geometry. But then we have the most basic parts of arithmetic, plus equals one, zero. I mean, I don't have to tell you what one and zero are, but they're like the beginnings of math, right? One, the beginning of counting, zero, the void. So it's all packed into this one equation. And on top of all of that, it's unbelievably surprising. What does it mean to raise a number to an imaginary power? And, and somehow, the formula is actually true. e to the i pi plus one equals zero. It has everything in the shortest space. So it's, it's parsimonious, it's beautiful, it's surprising, it connects. I mean, in math, the aesthetic high point is when you draw connections between things that don't seem connected. So here we connect algebra, geometry, calculus, arithmetic. I mean, that's a pretty beautiful equation. Absolutely. Thank yeah. you so much. <laughs> wow. Oh, okay. That's like a performance. Yeah, sorry for putting you on the spot there. And, and for the record, this was not rehearsed. No, it was at not all, rehearsed. So very much just threw that uh, out there for, for Steve because I knew he would um, nail it, and you did. Oh, well, thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you so much. Um, so I want to now kind of walk back a little bit in, in time. And uh, I know that, you know, a little bit about your childhood, but we haven't talked a lot about it. I know that, you know, you played tennis and basketball, and yeah. you're really into chess. You're, you know, a really good chess player. Uh, but you weren't particularly outdoorsy. Um, Didn't like bugs. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, but uh, so you know, I just want, uh, can, can you tell us, you know, how, when did math enter the equation? When did you know that both that you were you know, really good at it and that you wanted to pursue it? Interesting you assume I'm good at it. <laughs> All my lowest grades in college were in math. Really? Yeah. I don't think I'm especially good at it. I, I, not saying that for false modesty, I'm not an inherently modest person. I, I, <laughs> I'm really good at certain things, but math is probably one of my weakest subjects um, in terms of pure brain power, like in, to follow a complicated argument, all my colleagues are better. If, I, if you ranked me in the math department, I would probably be last, I'm sure of it. I, I'm slow, uh, anything that requires doing a fast calculation, I'm not good at. But I should come back to the question. Your question was, when did I discover I was good at math or that I loved math? And it was a very discreet moment. I was in a class, well, actually, I was in a geometry class and I was doing badly. Mm. Uh, so I had taken the first freshman, you know, in high school, Algebra two course. I, I was a little ahead. I had done some algebra already in middle school. So I was in this Algebra two course, it was fine. They put me in a geometry class taught by the football coach, which is a strange thing. A lot of times the coach <laughs> is thought to be someone suitable to teach math. I don't know why that, like, it's a very manly subject or some <laughs> ridiculous thing. And health too, right? Health too, okay. So anyway, Mr. White, the football coach, was teaching geometry and I was really bored in the class and not doing well. That's always been true my whole academic career. When I'm bored, I don't pay attention and don't do well. So I was bored and getting maybe a C or something. And then something great happened, which was that the school said, you shouldn't be doing this badly. Rather than punishing me or putting me in some remedial geometry, they said, we think you should skip geometry and do pre-calculus starting tomorrow. <laughs> and that was great. 
because then suddenly I had something interesting to learn about. And my teacher, Mr. Johnson, had a beard. He had gone to MIT. He, he wasn't the football coach. He, he seemed like, oh, I thought, okay, I could learn from Mr. Johnson. And he was very difficult, um, but fair. But he asked us a lot of hard questions. And so in the course of one of his uh, discussions one day, he mentioned that there was a certain geometry problem of all things. He wasn't teaching geometry, teaching pre-calculus. He said, here's this hard geometry problem. And I've been suggesting it to students for years, and I've never seen anyone do it. He just mentioned that. And I thought, that's interesting. What's, you know, I'll tell you the problem if you're curious. It was if two angle bisectors of a triangle are congruent. OK, so remember, an angle bisector cuts the angle in half equally, right? So mm -hmm. if two angle bisectors have the same length, the triangle is isosceles. Sort of seems like it would be true. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the other direction is easy. If the triangle is isosceles, showing that the angle bisectors are congruent is pretty easy. But to do it this direction, if congruent angle bisectors, then the triangle is isosceles. Mr. Johnson said that's a hard problem. So I thought that's very interesting. Then he said, actually, I don't know how to do it. And I thought, you're kidding. Mr. Johnson doesn't, with the beard, can't do <laughs> the angle bisector problem. How could that be? So I thought, OK, I, you know, I, until that time in my life, I could do any geometry problem the school asked me to do. So I started working on it, and I couldn't do it. And you know, I spent a day or two on it. I still couldn't do it. I thought about it all day long. Then it was weeks. I still couldn't do it. Then it was months. And the whole time I was in French class, and they would say, you know, conjugate these verbs. And they used to have, like, this kid had to conjugate this verb, and then it would go to the next kid, and it would go around the room like a train, and I could feel it was coming toward me, but I was thinking about the angle bisectors. <laughs> so it was really messing me up, both in basketball and in French class. <laughs> and um, I got obsessed with this question. OK, so you're wondering what happened. Well, at some point, I thought I had solved it. And it was a prep school, and Mr. Johnson lived close by uh, to the campus. And so I asked, could I, I think I got it. Can I come over to your house and show it to you? It was a Sunday morning, and he was there in his pajamas. His little kids were there. And he sat at his kitchen table. I showed him each step. He carefully, sternly checked each step. He said, it's correct proof. And then he wrote a little note to the headmaster of the school. Stephen has real talent. Gets me choked up thinking about it. <laughs> So just moving from that point when you, you, you found, you started to love math and you at some point uh, you did grad school, became a mathematician, uh, studied, um, became an applied mathematician and studied um, nonlinear dynamics, complex networks, um, your f and then uh, sort of the um, synchronization emergence of, of certain kinds of behaviors um, that you know, where order appears out of sort of seemingly chaotic, right, um, behaviors. And then you wrote your first popular book in 2003, a book called Sync, related to your work. First of all, what was the inspiration for that? And what were the challenges of going from teaching in a classroom to writing a book? You know, my whole life, I always thought I wanted to be a teacher, or if not a teacher, a science writer. So we skipped over that. I always thought I would like okay. to be a science writer. Okay. And I applied for summer internships and kept getting rejected. And including famously to me, I mean, I saved the letter from the New York Times that really? even our uh. copy boys have journalism degrees. Interesting. Uh, and I didn't know exactly what that meant, but I knew it was insulting. <laughs> <laughs> so, so um, OK, so I couldn't be a science writer. But I always kind of wanted to be. So anyway, yes, um, in the course of trying to solve the kinds of problems you need to solve to be a professor and get tenure and do the whole academic track, and, um, there wasn't any place for writing for the public. That was not considered mm -hmm. a good strategy or e advisable. Right, it shows misplaced priorities. Right. So Discouraged, right? Sometimes. Totally discouraged. Yeah, I mean, my department chairman said, even when I wanted to write a textbook, the book that you mentioned that, that you had read, um, the chair said, it won't, help, it won't really hurt you, but it takes away time from your research, and it definitely won't help you. So you shouldn't do it. But I did anyway, because I really wanted to. And I, I was frustrated that there weren't any books in my subject in nonlinear dynamics and chaos that I felt were readable for a beginner. So I just felt this compulsion. I'm glad you did it. it. I'm glad you disregarded that advice. 
uh, <laughs> I think it would, turned out to be a good, good choice. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people have thanked me for that book over the years. And also set you down a path, right? To yeah, I right. did what I wanted to do. I also didn't get tenure at MIT. So, I mean, they, they played their cards. They, they were open about what mattered to them, and what mattered to me wasn't exactly what ma But on the other hand, Cornell said, well, move here, and we'll give you tenure two years early. So I thought that sounded better. <laughs> but, but to the question of sync, um, the book Sync, I, <laughs> well, bit of a, I had just gotten married to Carol, who's here uh, in the audience, <laughs> ready to crawl under her seat. And we um, were having our first child at that point, and there was a popular TV show called Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? And we were starting to think about how would we ever pay for college on a professor's salary? <laughs> um, this is honestly what was in our head. I'm sorry, maybe you don't regret asking this question. <laughs> <laughs> but I was thinking I would like to find a way to make some money, and some, I was aware of people getting big advances for writing books for the public mm. about science. And Carol said to me, if you always say you want to do this, if you are serious and you want to do it, I think this would be a good time to do it. Because um, I w who wants to be a millionaire? I kept trying to get on. They wouldn't call me back. <laughs> so, so anyway, I did put in a proposal to write this book for the public, um, used an agent you know, that other science people, my friend Brian Green had used the same agent. Mm -hmm. And he said, use these people. They'll get you a big advance. And that all turned out to be true, and it was good, and our kids are now in college. <laughs> and, now, I did have the story that I wanted to tell. Yeah. I, I did, but that was true my whole life. The question, why then, was for the money. But you have the contract. You have to deliver a manuscript now. Yeah, yeah. There, there are certain challenges to producing an entire Many. book that people want to read, right? There so, were, yeah. yeah what, what was like maybe the, the top challenge, and how did you overcome it? The top challenge is self-censorship. Um, I, <laughs> I start typing and immediately want to hit the backspace or the delete button. I, you know, as you mentioned, mathematicians are trained to be critical. They only want to say what's exactly true, and it always requires a million caveats. So as a writer, I was very troubled by the difficulty of writing a true sentence. And um, so I was a painfully slow writer. <laughs> and I had friends advise me, the first draft has to be terrible. Don't worry about that. Don't, you can edit later. Just spit it out. But I had trouble doing that. And it was a painful book to write. It was a slow process. But what has helped me since then, because you mentioned to me before we started the conversation, you were hoping maybe I could share some tips. I do have a tip, okay. which is if you're a self-censoring person, and a lot of us are, um, the dictation function on your phone is very helpful. Mm -hmm. So I, I turn on my, nowadays when I write a book, I turn on my phone and talk into the phone and dictate in the notes app and don't expect it to be any good and just talk while I'm walking the dog. So I'll think of what section do I want to write and then just start talking. And it gives the book a very conversational sound mm -hmm. with automatic rhythms that are like spoken English because that's how it was generated. And most of it is bad, but it's easy enough to delete it later. But right. sometimes there are good nuggets. Right. But and it gets rid of the problem of, of trying to constantly self-edit. Yeah. I'm also, I never learned to touch type, so my typing is very bad, okay. which makes it easier to delete. So, so I think the dictation gets me to generate thousands of words in a day, which is otherwise impossible for me. And then editing, I love to do afterward. Let's just skip forward one, uh, again, quickly to your most recent book, um, Infinite Powers which came out in 2019, 2019, I think of it as your magnum opus, and it's, <laughs> it's about calculus, what it is, the history of it, and just, it, to me, like reading that book, anyone can read that book and come away with a very, very good sense of what calculus is and how it works without actually having to do any calculus. Mm. Right, and so talk talk through a little bit of, of your evolution as a writer from sync now to oh, thank you. infinite powers, and that's a very astute question. I really wanted to tell the story. It was a love story of calculus, mm -hmm. and I love the subject of calculus. It's my favorite part of math. Uh, I think it's one of the all-time greatest ideas, uh, right up there with democracy and quantum mechanics, you know, and Darwinism, and you know, there are just a few, yep. relativity, there are a few ideas that really change the world, and calculus absolutely is one of them. Absolutely. 
But you wouldn't get that from a calculus book. Right. You would get a oh, thousand yeah. pages of the integration by parts yep. and related rates. Procedures, yeah. You know. mm -hmm. So yeah. it seems terrible. There's something so monumental here, and this needs to be told. I a really large part of the population doesn't know anything about no, it, really. A right? large population either doesn't know it or has a distorted picture of it from the course that they took. Right. Okay, so I wanted to convey that, but how? Is it just about the ideas of calculus? Is it about the people, the stories of calculus? Or is it about how calculus changed the world? Mm -hmm. And I want it to be about all three. Mm -hmm. So I want it to be both the applications, uh, not both, I want three. I want the applications, I want the history, mm -hmm. and I want the ideas. And I didn't really know how to do that, but I knew that that's what I wanted to do. And so rather than write an outline of something that I couldn't imagine, I just walked around talking into my phone <laughs> for a long time. It was extremely painful to write that book. <laughs> I keep using the word pain, don't I? <laughs> <laughs> Writing is hard. Writing is hard. Let's, really let's just hard. get that, you know, yeah. establish that for now. I wrote a first draft that I was moderately happy with, and my great editor, Eamon Dolan, said, it's, it's really nice, but wouldn't it be great? This is editor speak. You know, wouldn't it be nice if every chapter had something like that chapter where you explain how calculus helped make HIV into a manageable chronic illness rather than a near certain death sentence, which was the way it was when AIDS was ravaging the country. Mm -hmm. So he said, that was a compelling example. Wouldn't it be nice if every chapter had that? And I thought, yes, it sure would be nice. And that's what I meant to do the first, but I hadn't written that book yet. So then I had to rewrite the whole book. And then after I did that, he said, the book is so much better and it's really great. Wouldn't it be nice if there was a whole story that went all the way through from beginning to end and like one principle or one big idea that would... So I said, you're right, that would be good. And then I had to write that book. So it was unbelievably hard for the family. I, I keep, pain wasn't just me, like psychic pain of my own work. It was very hard for the family. I was upstairs in my attic working. My dog missed me. My wife missed me. Kids, I mean, it was really not easy. No. But I'm very proud of the result. It feels to me like, and actually the ending of the book came to me on one of those walks. <laughs> and as I was dictating, I started crying. It was such a perfect ending. Really a weird out-of-body experience. Those of you who are creative musicians or artists or whatever, you know sometimes your art takes you. You didn't see it coming. And this is what an outline will not do for you. A, a real writer, well, I should have real, but, you know, <laughs> some, let yourself go. I didn't know how to do that when I wrote mm -hmm. Sync. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I was very happy with um, these weird, deep wells of subconscious stuff that the words came out. Like Paul McCartney has talked about that with mm -hmm. writing. I'm mm -hmm. not saying I could do write lyrics like Paul McCartney, but you know what I mean. You're a writer yourself. So sometimes your own art can really um, transport you. So for the last few minutes, I, I, I want to talk also, of course, about our podcast. That, yes, thank uh, you. We spent the last few years producing uh, First the Joy of X and now the newest um, podcast uh, that you're uh, hosting for Quanta is called The Joy of Why. And I wonder if you could maybe just start from talking a little bit about what was uh, the joy of X about and what did we change for the joy of Y? Well, yeah, so the joy of X was our, first of all, thanks a lot for letting me be part of the Quanta team. I love your whole enterprise, your magazine, your stories. You are yourself fantastic as no, an no, editor. No, Okay, we don't have to go there. Well, let me say this then. <laughs> Since we're going back and, and, and uh, compliment each other. The, okay. <laughs> in thinking about a new podcast for Quanta, I remember being on vacation with my family and thinking, you know, what should this new podcast be about? Who should be the host? And it just sort of mm. dawned on me, the host has to be Steve Strogatz. <laughs> it, well, it really it occurred yeah, to me. I reached out. I was so thrilled that you said yes. Because I, I was thinking I would love to figure out a way to do a podcast. And I, to me... The timing was perfect. Quanta's the Rolls Royce of science journalism. Oh, well, thank you. Just, was delighted to do it. Okay, well, um, Joy of X, to me, was based on the vision that the radio is intimate, that podcasts are coming into your ear, and that's the most intimate thing, to, to listen to someone else's stories and words. So I felt I wanted to have scientists and mathematicians talk about their inner lives. What does it feel like to make discoveries? Why are they in love with the questions they work on? What were their own journeys? So it's a very intimate show about the scientists' themselves. Mm -hmm. It tended to be meandery. I, I w deliberately wanted a very spontaneous conversational vibe with them, and we didn't have much planned out. We let it go where it went. Mm -hmm. The joy of why is 
uh, about the questions. It puts the big questions first. So are you more interested in black holes or the scientists who work on black holes? They're, both are reasonable answers. If you're more interested in black holes, and then you will learn a lot about you know, the origin of life, black holes, why do we have to sleep? It's all about the great timeless mysteries of science. And, I mean, it's not like we're neglecting the scientists. We are talking to living, breathing scientists, and they do tell their stories. And there are very um, spontaneous and animated moments in our conversations. But we're really sticking to the conversation about the big questions and current thinking about them. Part of this conversation has been about transitions, right? Your transition from a uh, mathematician and teacher, to a writer, and now to a podcast host. Like, what did you have to learn? So the teacher side of me sometimes hears my guests saying things in a way that I'm imagining my listeners may not exactly get it. And so I might rephrase uh, what the person has just said. And a lot of times I'm truly confused by what they just said. I'm not playing possum. It's not a gimmick. <laughs> Like, are you saying such and such? <laughs> I really don't know. Are you saying such? <laughs> so I will ask those what I hope are clarifying questions. And um, sometimes those really land, I think. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I think, you know, again, it just shows what a great teacher you are. I think we're really lucky to have you as the host wow. for The Joy of Why. I hope all of you will listen to it. Uh, we have a trailer out right now. Next Thursday is the first full episode. Uh, you can subscribe to all, all the major podcasting platforms. So thank you all for coming tonight.